Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, February 26, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the FCC passes over 300 pages of secret net neutrality. And Obama takes gun grabbing to the next level with executive actions. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. 1776 started when you tried to get him, you bastards. And as Charlton Heston famously said, from my cold dead hand, you sons of you got that? You're not getting our firearms. Well, Obama makes some pretty amazing admissions when he's talking to groups of illegal immigration advocates. Just like a short time ago, he said, hey, I changed the law for you. Even though 22 times previously he had said, under the Constitution, I don't have any authority to change the law. This is what he said yesterday at an immigration town hall meeting in Miami. Leader of the Senate uh, and the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, uh, want to have a vote on whether what I'm doing is legal or not. They can have that vote. I will veto that vote. Now, of course, Obama doesn't really have to worry about the Republicans in the House or Senate trying to stop him voting on his unconstitutional amnesty by executive action. They work for the same masters that he does. But it's an amazing admission. You want to have a vote on this? Go ahead. I'll veto it. Of course, they won't vote on impeachment for somebody that acts and talks like this. He made some other admissions, too. He said, what we've done here is we've expanded my authorities. We've expanded my authorities under executive action, is what he says. He's expanded his authorities. See, before he said he didn't have any way that he could change the uh, law for the immigrants because I was against the Constitution. Then he did it, said, I've changed the law for you. He says, you can't stop me. I've expanded my authorities. And then he says one other thing that's kind of interesting. He says, we're going to keep with the, on with the political process on a separate track. Yeah, he's going to try to go down the political process, try to get some cover for what he's doing illegally, unconstitutionally. But even if he can't, he's going to continue doing it just like the NSA does. And of course, it's not just Obama. It would be a very simple problem if all we had to do was replace Obama or if all we had to do was replace the Democrats. The problem is the entrenched federal bureaucracy that works with him that's essentially become a feral bureaucracy. These pet dogs that were supposed to serve and protect us, to serve our interests, to rule with our consent, have essentially become a pack of wolves. That's what happens to dogs when they go feral. That's what's happened to our government. Listen to what a former FBI director said. If you're uh, submitting budget proposals for a law enforcement agency, for an intelligence agency, you're not going to submit the proposal that we won the war on terror and everything's great because the first thing's going to happen is your budget's going to be cut in half. You know, it's my uh, opposite of Jesse Jackson's keep hope alive. This is keep fear alive. This is keep fear alive. So you understand, they're never going to declare war on terror over. They're never going to declare a victory for the drug war or for the terror war. Of course, terror is just a tactic. But the nature of all these bureaucracies is to protect themselves, to have a continuity, not only just of government, but a continuity of their bureaucracy, and to build their empires. That's what they're really concerned. They're not concerned about your safety, your security, your consent. They're not going to provide you with health care. They're not going to provide you with Internet access. They simply want to grow. They're simply a cancer. And the way they do this is with fear and also with secrecy. We see today that the FCC says that they've now approved these new Internet rules. Of course, it's for net neutrality. No, it's not. It's about growing the bureaucracy. Of course, we still cannot even see these rules. We're not allowed to know what they are. And listen to this quote. No one, he says, this is the FCC uh, commissioner talking, no one should control free and open access to the Internet. Does he see the irony in that? He's set himself up as the one who's going to control it. They say we shouldn't have gatekeepers to the Internet, so they make themselves the gatekeepers. He also goes on and says the Internet is the most powerful and pervasive pl platform on the planet. The Internet is too important to allow broadband providers to make the rules. They haven't been making the rules for the last couple of decades. That's not the issue. Net neutrality is not even an issue anymore, as Paul Joseph Watson pointed out in his previous report. This was something that was resolved. It was a conflict between Comcast and Netflix. They resolved that issue, as it always happens in a free market on a free Internet.
We've had the internet for decades, and we didn't need this kind of control. Now what we're going to have is the government controlling it. Not even the government, not even our elected representatives, but three politically appointed bureaucrats at the FCC are going to control the internet. It's too important for that. What's it going to look like? Well, look at China, for example. We can see what's been done there. And there's some very interesting observations in this article from the uh, Christian Science Monitor. They say, cyberspace, as the thinking went, would prove too vast and too wild for the Beijing government to keep under its thumb. But now these early assumptions are being sharply revised under an authoritarian government determined to control information. China has grown a new version of the Internet. That can happen here under an authoritarian government that is determined to maintain control of information. Can you not see that that's what's happening in every aspect of our life? And of course, we're going to see that with the, uh, with the Second Amendment as well, not just the First Amendment. It's everything that Obama is doing and the bureaucracy. And of course, they can do it just as China has done. They've essentially shown the way for this to proceed. They say, in order to harness the network's business potential, the article continues to say the success of Beijing's strategy to harness the network's business potential while minimizing it as a conduit for free speech. There you go. Who would have thought that China would provide the model of fascism that would be pursued, not communism, but fascism that would be pursued here in America to stifle free speech and political dissent? And of course, that's just it. Allowing the business potential to run on while they shut down all criticism of the government and ignore any laws. Of course, they didn't have a Bill of Rights to start with or a constitution, so that made things a little bit easier for them, but that doesn't seem to be an obstacle for Obama or for the Congress. They go on to say the biggest danger is that China creates a very large market and a testing ground for surveillance and filtering software. That's what we're seeing. And of course, Reporters Without Borders have summed it up this way. They said China was one of the first countries to realize that it couldn't do without the internet, and so it had to be brought under control. That's what's happening now in America. They say it's one of the few countries where they've managed to block all material that criticizes the regime while still expanding internet facilities. Because, hey, they can make money out of that. And money, of course, is power. Now, even before we get to that level of government suppression, though, we still have a we can still see the tactics that the left is using. When they're not winning the argument, whether it's vaccines or whether it is any other political argument, they resort to censorship. That's what makes us so concerned about how this is going to run down. We know that this has been used in the past. We know that the FCC has not limited itself strictly to monitoring frequencies or allocating frequencies. Quite frankly, the Constitution gave Congress the authority to regulate commerce that was foreign and between the states, interstate commerce. Using that, in 1912, after the Titanic uh, disaster, they said, we need to have some kind of control over the uh, radio broadcasters and telegraph operators so this doesn't happen again, so we don't have this drop-off in communication during a disaster. So they enacted a law in 1912, essentially establishing a, the predecessor of the FCC. Later on, they created the FCC. They gave it those powers along with the Interstate Commerce Commission that would regulate things that were commerce that was going on between states, not even within a state. Do you see how this is starting to metastasize? Now we're at the point where they're regulating everything, not just within the states, but also everything that we say or do. That's how these bureaucracies metastasize. Of course, they could have just had an auction for the frequencies and then just left it alone like we did for land. And of course, there's already frequencies that have been allocated in the spectrum so they could just go on with the private property rights and just shut down the FCC. But that's not what they're going to do. And we're going to see that those on the left, when they don't win the argument, they're going to come after us trying to censor what we're saying. We can see this now with the attacks on Rush Limbaugh that are continuing. There's a movement called Stop Rush. And now they're even targeting his staff members. We see this as a story that was on Media Equalizer. They say that apparently not satisfied with their efforts to intimidate Rush Limbaugh's advertisers, the left's Stop Rush Crusade is now allegedly targeting his spokesperson. Now, this is uh, someone who's basically a, a PR person for Rush Limbaugh. What they've done, and this is very interesting, one of the persons in particular has been very busy filing frivolous lawsuits. One of the seven most active members of Stop Rush, Carol Kernahan Wallen, 
has made two failed attempts at securing a restraining order against Glicklick. Now, this is the guy who's the, uh, the PR spokesman for Rush Limbaugh. However, she failed to appear at court. And finally, when she went the third time, the judge struck it down. The interesting thing is, is that what she came after him said that he was a cyber stalker because he put, uh, he requested that it be, that a picture that she put up of he and his wife from their wedding, that that would be taken down. And so for that, she called him a cyber stalker and she went to the next step trying to get a restraining order from him, but she would not show up at court. So he's been putting out tweets exposing the people who are trying to harass him, who are making violent threats against him. Now, as he was using Twitter to push back and expose what these people were doing, now Twitter, they say this is a update, after they published this article, Twitter suspended Glicklick's account shortly after this piece was posted. It's really amazing when you look at the details at the article that he put up. Now, Russia's PR agent spells this out in an article with details. And as I mentioned before, this began with the wedding photo that she was publishing. He says, the source of her lawsuit, he says, is my publication of a legal notice I sent to her after she repeatedly stole and published a family wedding photo in order to harass my wife and I. And when it finally came to court, first two times she didn't show up, the third time, the court said the facts as stated in the petition do not sufficiently show acts of violence, threats of violence, or a course of conduct that seriously alarmed, annoyed, or harassed the petitioner or caused substantial emotional distress. In other words, it's nonsense. And so he countersued to try to stop that. That didn't stop her, though. She used the Daily Cause to publish an article. And listen to the title of the article. Rush Limbaugh hires cyber stalker as stations and advertisers continue to drop him. So she called him a stalker because he said, stop using my wedding picture and posting it everywhere. And so because of that, she called him a stalker. And this is the way that it goes. This is the attitude of the people that we are opposing who want to shut down free speech, who are very authoritarian, who when they can't win the arguments, just resort to the use of force. We have more information about that in the next segment. We're going to take a look at the laws in Oregon trying to shut down informed consent as well as Obama's move along with the feral bureaucracy to destroy the Second Amendment by banning ammunition. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com with a call to action. I want everyone, if you're close to Chicago, if you're around that area, tomorrow Josh Owens and I of Infowars will be flying into Chicago to help expose the tyranny at this black site. The Chicago PD says they know about it, but they're not doing anything about it. This is a site that they are detaining and arresting American citizens off the record. They're doing it off the record because what they're doing is wrong. And anytime lawyers, anyone goes up there and tries to find out who's in there, they say that they are jeopardizing ongoing investigations. This is out of control. This is something that needs to stop. And I encourage each and every one of you right now watching this video, get up off your couch, throw your Cheetos away, turn off the TV, and come to Hammond Square this Saturday at 3 p.m. This isn't just for the people in Chicago. We don't know how many other sites could be operating in America that are like this. This could be in your backyard. This should piss off everyone. You've got two days to be there. You can get on a plane, a bus, a train, drive your car, get in there, get as many people together. There should be thousands of people who are angry and pissed off about this, just like we are. So I encourage you, Saturday at 3 p.m., come to 3379 West Fillmore Street in Chicago, Illinois. That is a spot where Hammond Square is. There will be a protest going on. We will be out there filming, talking to people, trying to get the reactions of how people feel about something like this being operated on in American soil. This is something that's got to stop. So everyone, please share this video, get your friends together, and I encourage each and every one to come out there and have your voices be heard because we've had enough of this tyranny. Our country is falling apart. And we need people who are willing to stand up and come out and protest and have their voices heard. That's the only way we can make changes. So please come out and support the info wars, support liberty, support the American way of life. Once again, I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com.
knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com. Oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market. Sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 well, in the last segment, we were talking about how Obama and the federal bureaucracy are expanding like a cancer. And of course, they always do it by finding some kind of a seminal moment, some kind of an emergency, some felt need. They push on people's fear, just as this whole thing we see with the FCC moving to take over control of the Internet with three politically appointed commissioners going to control the entire internet. How did that start? That started with a reaction to the Titanic sinking and people saying we need to have better communications. We see the same thing happening with the FAA. They've even planted a little drone on the White House lawn to show people that things are very serious or they highlight the incidents of somebody flying a drone at a very high elevation so that it might collide with a plane. But they seize on these incidents and then go way beyond any authority that they have under the Constitution. And then once they establish their authority, they will continue to move the barriers. That's what the founders understood, especially about the Second Amendment. They said, make no law restricting freedom of religion or speech, but they knew that the way they would come after uh, the Second Amendment would not be with a blanket law prohibiting everything. No, they would come little by little. They would take that fence that keeps them out and they would move it a couple of inches in and keep infringing just as your neighbor would move the fence on. If you let it stand, it becomes his property. The way Obama is doing this now is coming after ammunition. He says that he's going to ban bullets and he's working with, guess what? A federal bureaucracy to write laws that Congress will not write to ban bullets by executive action. So he's going to as promised in the article we have on Infowars.com, it says Obama is now using executive actions to impose gun control on the nation because that's precisely what he's doing when he comes after the ammunition. Now, in another article that we have today, Kit Daniels points out that AR-15 ammo is not armor-piercing. That's their excuse. They say these are cop-killing bullets. We have to remove these because they're armor-piercing, not according to the law. The ATF, nevertheless, is going to ban it anyway because they don't read the regulations. They don't read the Constitution. The broad regulation of the Constitution is something they're not concerned with, so they're not going to read the fine points. But here's what the fine point says, just so you know how they're violating the law. He says the ATF is trying to ban M855 AR-15 ammunition by declaring it armor-piercing despite the ammo containing lead, which exempts it from the classification according to the law. And he quotes the law here, and he says, to be considered armor-piercing, a bullet must have an entirely metal core or have a jacket weighing more than 25% of its weight 
which wouldn't include the M855 rounds because their bullets are partly lead. There you go. Doesn't even qualify under their own regulations. But they don't care what their regulations say. The law is in their mouth, just as it is in Obama's. Obama can't violate the law because he is the law. Whatever he says is the law. And we see this attitude from the president down to the cop on the street. Take a look at this cop confronting an open carry activist who is not even violating any state, presumed state laws. Then uh, the officer clearly, and you can hear it plain as day, the officer says, you're not under arrest and you're not being detained. I do not consent to questioning and I do not have ID. You can try all you want with your constitutional bull****, all right? Dude, look, you can try this constitutional crap all you want, but I got news for you, okay? I'm part of that 3% that you're trying to represent. Here's the bottom line. If you respect the contents of a document, you don't refer to those contents as crap and bull****. So do you think anything's going to happen to that officer who says that the Constitution he swore to is total BS and acts as if he feels that way? He made another interesting statement in that. He said, uh, if you don't show me your ID, how do I know that you're not a felon? If you violate the Constitution, how do I know that you're a law officer? That's another question we could ask him. We're very concerned about the violations that we see coming against the First Amendment because the FCC has in the past regulated speech content. And they currently regulate a lot of things that would, should fall under protected political speech. They currently do that. So we know they're going to use this as censorship. We know they're going to regulate speech. We know that Obama is trying to infringe on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It isn't about having a rifle on the wall is about being able to use it. Of course, they can take that away if they can take away your ammunition. But we should be very concerned even about the rights that are protected under the Ninth Amendment. Remember the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution, we've specifically put in things about free speech, freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms. Even if we didn't put these rights that we possess from God, even if we didn't put them in explicitly, that means that those certain rights that we still possess shall not be construed to deny or disparage others that are retained by the people. So we delegate those to the government. Now, one of those, of course, is informed consent. Standing in opposition to medical dictates from the government. And we see many state issues in both Oregon and California and other places on the East Coast where they're saying, we're going to remove the personal belief exemption and we're going to mandate vaccines. Now, understand when they use that terminology, they're talking about informed consent. They're saying, this is your personal belief. This is your faith. It's not based on any facts or any science. No, actually, it is. We have some real reasons to be concerned about that. And they say, we're going to not give you an exemption from our orders. They don't have a right to order us in the first place. This is the way it plays down in Oregon. This is a lawyer, his name is Robert Snee, challenging the state senator, Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, MD, on her Oregon bill SB 422, which would remove personal exemption. Interestingly enough, in an article that was published in the American Academy of Family Physicians, the sponsor of this bill is quoted as disregarding the treating, her treating doctor's advice because, in the paraphrase, I did the research and disagreed with her recommendation. She chose to breastfeed her child despite the medication that she was taking um, for her condition and despite the risk to her child from that medication. There was a greater certainty of... I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I have to interrupt. Yes, please. My integrity has just been impugned by the witness. I'm, and I want to be really clear here, sir. I'm not... You, no, sir, please allow me to respond. Sure. Thank you, I appreciate that. My doctor at that time was responding, in fact, to drug company paranoia because they'd never tested it in pregnant and breastfeeding women. I called the national expert on drugs and lactation from the University of Texas and asked him personally to clarify that interferons did not transfer from breast milk from the mother's tissue into breast milk before I made that decision for my child. And I also was well aware that breastfeeding is the best thing you can do to protect children from autoimmune diseases. So I would be very grateful if you did not take my decision, my personal decision about my medical care out of context. Thank you. Oh. All right, please. Remember, no, mine was science-based. We do not, <laughs> all right. 
I will have to ask people to leave if we don't have decorum. We do not impugn others. All right? My Thank statement you. was not intended in any manner of impugning or, or maligning the sponsor of this bill, only pointing out that her right to exercise her informed consent and make a different decision in her treating doctor is the same right that we as citizens are seeking for ourselves. As the title to the article says, Medical Tyranny in Action in Oregon, a doctor and senator wants medical freedom for herself but not Oregon citizens. Do you understand how this plays out? Of course, she was being treated for MS. She was being, being given interferon. Her doctor said, do not breastfeed your child. The pharmaceutical companies said, do not do this. But she did some research and she talked to someone at the University of Texas who gave her a second opinion, a different opinion, and she exercised her personal right to make that decision about whether or not she wanted to do that. And I think it's very interesting that she doesn't want to allow us to have that freedom. And that's what he was calling her out on. That's the hypocrisy of this. He said something else that we should all remember, and of course we've seen this quoted many times when people talk about medical tyranny in his comments to the panel there. He quoted Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, who has warned us about medical tyranny, how it would come. He said, the Constitution of this Republic, as they were trying to create the Constitution, he said, here's something we need to put into it. He said, the Constitution of this Republic should make special provision for medical freedom. To restrict the art of healing to one class will constitute the Bastille of medical science. And of course, that one class is the AMA. All such laws are un-American and despotic. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an undercover dictatorship and force people who wish doctors and treatments of their own choice to submit to only what the dictating outfit offers. The Constitution of the Republic should make a special provision for medical freedom as well as religious freedom. Exactly. That was a defect in the Constitution. But it was fixed in the Bill of Rights. It was fixed by Amendment Number 9 that says, just because we don't mention medical freedom, we are not relinquishing those rights to the government. Unless we explicitly give those rights to the government, it's what 10 says, they don't have those rights. Unless they're delegated to them by the states and by the people, the Constitution doesn't have those rights. Now they have turned that exactly upside down, saying that they have power to do anything and everything they want unless they're expressly forbidden. But even express prohibition of government activity does not stop them. That's where we stand today. We need to understand that even though the federal government, the feral bureaucracies, who are now wild, no longer think that there's any restrictions on them, they no longer have any legal authority. That's what we need to understand. We need to understand that this is not about neutrality, this is about liberty. People don't understand net neutrality and they certainly don't understand and value liberty anymore. That's our responsibility to bring that message to the people of America. Stay with us right after the break. We have an interview. Rob Dew is going to be talking to the author of Hidden History, Donald Jeffries. It's one of the books that we sell at Infowars.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. Well, here at a supermarket in Toledo, you can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must-have for every modern, independently-minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world 
praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. You don't have to be a doctor to know. The fall and winter months are the most dangerous time of year in North America when it comes to you and your family's health. InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of silver bullet colloidal silver exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high quality silver bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your silver bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and I'll be conducting the interview portion of today's show. Thank you for David Knight for doing the news. Our next guest is an author and researcher who has basically kept me busy for the last couple of weeks reading this amazing book, Hidden History, which kind of goes through every conspiracy from John F. Kennedy all the way up to the Bilderberg Group and what we see today in the modern times, not the Bilderberg Group back in the 50s, but as researchers and reporters have started covering it. Uh, his name is Donald Jeffries, and we actually sell Hidden History here at the InfoWars store, and I definitely want to encourage people to go out there and check out a copy of it. It covers the, the gambit, and we're going to get into that book, but we're also going to get into some news, especially with this Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush uh, battle royale that we're going to have to endure for the next two or three years. Ugh, I'm really loathing this, but we have now the author of Hidden History. Don, first let me say I think Hidden History is a great book, and I want to get into it. But first, let's talk about some news that's going on, especially this Clinton-Bush dynasty that we're looking at again. But before we get into that, I want to talk about a Breitbart article that just came out. was on the Drudge Report. Amnesty beneficiaries could claim more than $35,000 in tax benefits in the first year. I mean, to you, what is the biggest red flag about this immigration program that is now being implemented under the Obama administration? Well, they're really just ratcheting up what's been going on now since the 1980s when uh, Reagan's uh, so-called Immigration Reform Act really closed the barn door <laughs> at that point. And uh, it's just amazing to me. This is, this is an issue probably, I would say, 95 percent of Americans, if you poll them, would realize it's wrong to be doing this kind of stuff for illegal aliens or um, recently, as Alex has been covering, how it's against the law now. To, or against the law, basically, to arrest them for drunk driving and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, these are senseless things. And who, who supports them? What is the purpose of them? And it should be something left and right can agree upon. But unfortunately, the left can't go against anything to do with more immigrants because of political correctness. And the right just wants cheap labor. So they come together in a coalition to support this when it, all it does is drive down wages and uh, really is destroying the working class in this country. And I've seen articles of, of state reps and, and even our and congressmen, especially there was one from Oregon who was doing a speech, and he said, if we don't get this amnesty through, this could change the political landscape for the next 20 or 30 years. So they're openly admitting that this is to create a voting block to come in and take away people's rights and to take away the guns first, and then they're going to, I think, start promoting this vac forced vaccine agenda. And it, it's just whatever the government wants after that is going to be carte blanche. What do you say to that? Exactly. And it, again, it's, it's something where I don't understand why so many, uh, really this should be an issue the left especially is concerned about because big labor used to be an essential part of the Democratic Party. And that big labor is all but disappeared, as a whether you agree with that or not, as a political force. But, you know, immigration impacts uh, wages, it impacts benefits, it obviously drives everything down for those blue collar workers that used to have good jobs. And it should be a, a, a no-brainer issue for them, but they can't bring it up because of political correctness. The right used to be more effective in combating uh, immigration, but again, they've just sold out to, uh, you know, to big business. And okay, whatever increases our profits, we're not looking at the long-term picture and how it affects society. Yeah, it seems they've pretty much given in with this new DHS funding bill. They're, they're just like, well, you know, our hands are tied. It's it's either if if we don't fund the immigrants, the terrorists are going to win. It's, it seems to be that sort of attitude, that type of mind control and mind game that they're playing against us. Um, now, what do you think about Jeb Bush coming out and running for, looks like he's going to run for president. He's automatically the front runner when he comes in, even though we've had two Bushes already. And they've pretty much destroyed the country. You've had 
the, the first Bush, you could pretty much say he had three terms because you had just the beginning of Reagan's term when he, when he almost took over when Reagan was assassinated. And then if you look at Reagan, he was pretty much the corpse bride, not really doing much, but just kind of nudged along. They bring him out whenever they need him to, to speak on something. And then you have the Clinton years, and then we're back with Bush the Younger, and now we're looking at, at, at Bush. I don't know, what are we going to call this guy? Yeah, just, just what we need another Bush. I, it, it, it just amazes me. You know, somehow we can't even accept a third party, let alone a fourth or a fifth like so many other countries. But, you know, here we're going to restrict ourselves to two ruling families. It just, I, I just can't fathom it. I mean, Bush is going to be the, the exact same type of Republican that is... Uh, his brother and father were, that Bob Dole was, that John McCainiac was. I mean, you know, he's going to be for war. He's going to be, you know, for more immigration. He's going to be uh, for NAFTA and any other free trade agreement. Just all the disastrous things that have helped destroy the country. And I, I can't see why the Republican Party would support him, but, you know, that's that's the way they are. They, they want to be, uh, they want to copy. And I, I read in the article that, you uh, he was talking about, well, we don't want to be anti-immigration, we want to be anti-this, as if anybody in power in the Republican Party is that way. Yeah, they've all been bought off. And this is just another uh, signpost that it's not so bad that it's going to be Jeb Bush and then somebody else that we don't know on, on the Democratic side. It's going to be most likely Hillary Clinton. I mean, you're looking at a Clinton-Bush election once again. And what does that really mean? What does that say to our basic values as a country, our basic understanding of history? Is just, do people not get it? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, they, apparently they don't get it. I, I really think the last, and as we saw, you know, the, the last president at any rate that, that was uh, actually a man of peace was John F. Kennedy, one of the reasons he was killed. I, and, and to, you know, since that time, we've had other Democratic presidents. Bill Clinton certainly has shown uh, a great propensity to bomb other countries, and uh, obviously Barack Obama has as well. And it seems that the Democratic Party is not going to let any kind of a peacenik-type candidate in there. Hillary Clinton is certainly going to go for whatever their foreign meddling is. I don't think she's going to turn them down the way JFK did. So you're, it's gonna, you're going to have, again, no choice. Maybe they'll you know, debate gay marriage or something. That's what basically comes down to. Is that, is that what we're that concerned about? Issues that really don't affect the vast majority of us. Issues of little or no significance, they turn into this big football issue that people can toss back and forth and bitch about at the water cooler. But, you know, no, they don't talk about the Federal Reserve. They don't talk about endless wars. They don't talk about drones uh, overseeing us. They do talk about wanting to force vaccinate us. That seems to be big on the agendas now on both sides. Both sides are both coming out. That's how you know it's evil, when both sides are for it. And they're, they're coming out saying, hey, we got to take away parental choice. we got to take away informed consent. If, if the drug companies come up with a drug and it goes through our loophole FDA process that really doesn't even offer much oversight to these drug companies, we're just going to rubber stamp it and force it down into your body. Exactly. I think you can be safely rest assured that both uh, Hillary and Jeb Bush will be uh, for vaccinations. I don't think they're going to be coming out against vaccinations. And, and looking at corruption, it, the Clinton Foundation accepted millions of dollars from seven foreign governments during uh, Hillary's Clint, uh, tenure as Secretary of State, including one donation that violated the eth ethics agreement with the Obama administration. I mean, it, the, these people just have no cause at whatsoever to be leaders anywhere. And that's what I really like about your book, Hidden History. I actually started in the middle. Um, if you go to the table of contents, I believe I started on chapter six, which is the Clinton years. Because when I grew up, I, I was kind of aware of what was going on. I, there was a big uh, secretary, uh, Speaker of the House battle with Newt Gingrich and the Project for a New American, uh, or the, the Contract with America. But I didn't really pay much attention to this stuff because I had already seen the left-right paradigm. I was already aware of that. But going into this, uh, the Clinton years, so many deaths that have occurred under the Clinton administration, which I think we're going to see more of with Hillary when she gets in. Uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. going into W, 9-11, your book really lays out in an easy to read factual form the last, you know, you go back all the way to, to John F. Kennedy, but just looking at the Clinton years and Bush the other, just the last 40 years of what's been going on in our world, you really lay it out in an easy to read fashion. You're naming names, you're not pulling punches, and it's a really hard hitting book. And it, it's quick. I got through six, uh, chapter six to chapter 17 in about uh, four days because it was so enthralling. I'm just like, I can't believe all this information that I had lost through the years. And it's just a great way to like really, um, you know, just get a gestalt of what's been going on in our world. Well, thank you for the kind words. Uh, 
Yeah, hopefully what I tried to do in the book is to show how there's been, you know, basically an uninterrupted timeline. It doesn't matter who's in office, uh, because these, are these you know, presidents and uh, senatorial leaders, House leaders are, are basically puppets. Uh, someone's pulling their strings, but the, the policies never change. If there's a big free trade agreement, it's going to go through. If there's a global meddling to be done in some country where we're going to, you know, go over and try to impose our will on them, it's going to go through. It just, it just happens. It's inevitable that no one in a position of power opposes it. And uh, the body count, as you mentioned, is Clinton body count was probably more famous than some of the others, but, you know, both Bushes had a body count, Reagan had a body count, LBJ certainly had a body count, and Obama has a body count. And uh, it's just these unnatural deaths seem to follow these leaders. And, uh, you know, people, you know, people don't normally fall out of, off of high buildings or die in plane crashes or die in train wrecks. Most people die from cancer or heart attacks. But if you're associated with these powerful figures, you tend to die unnaturally. And that, that ought to open people's eyes. But, you know, somehow it doesn't seem to. I don't know how much coincidence they can accept, you know. It, the press is totally bought off in this. You know, nobody really wanted to investigate Gary Webb. I think a lot of the press was happy when he supposedly committed suicide by shooting himself twice. And they would gladly go along with that, that fable that, oh yeah, it's totally possible to shoot yourself twice in the head. When it, I, I don't know when that's ever happened, unless it's been a homicide. And now you see it down in Argentina. Uh, you know, the Argentinian president is trying to back away from, from the prosecutor who just ends up dead right before he's about to go testify. But it just shows that governments are corrupt. And absolute governments are absolutely corrupt. And um, I'm in the, uh, the JFK portion of your book right now, chapter, chapter one and chapter two. And just, you know, take people back. This was all kind of set up with the Kennedy assassination, this mindset that we're in now where they bring together a group of politicians to investigate themselves. No wrongdoing is ever found. No one's ever held accountable. And in any of these, there's, there's, you know, the Secret Service, nobody got fired after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. You know, after 9-11, nobody gets fired. People get promotions. We just see it time and time again. Anytime the government messes up, well, they didn't know. It's okay. It's not their fault. But anytime we mess up, oh, it's jail time. It's it's fines. It's it's court cost. It It's death. It could even be death. You could be killed by, you know, uh, black ski mask soldiers coming in to, on a drug raid for drugs that they bring into this country. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, the, the assassination of President Kennedy is all important. It was a seminal event of my generation. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it's uh, hackneyed to say that it was the, uh, it's cliche to say that it was the beginning of the loss of innocence, you know, that the 60s really began with the assassination of JFK. And, uh, the Eisenhower years almost ended at that point, the innocence. And uh, the fact that it was never investigated, that's what people don't uh, seem to understand, is that it was, the crime was never investigated. The Warren Commission never set out to, they didn't even have, they, they divided into subgroups, and none of the groups, as Mark Lane said originally on, was you ought to have add a group here who killed JFK. It was all about a biography of Oswald, a prosecutorial brief uh, against Oswald, but they never attempted to follow any leads. And, uh, you know, since that time, and no journalist at the time, Nobody from the New York Times, the Washington Post, any of the television networks, they all followed right along. Uh, they never did any investigative reporting, and they still haven't. The only, the only reason we know anything about the flaws in the official case is because citizen activists like Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg and Sylvia Marr and so many others came out and, and did all the work on their own. They didn't have subpoena power. They didn't, uh, you know, they couldn't, uh, they, most of them weren't lawyers. But they were able to expose the flaws in the case and, and make uh, the overall majority of people realize how absurd the uh, the loan assassin fairy tale was. Yeah, and that got so much press. It was one guy. We've got him. Oh, now he's dead. Uh, even though he came out and said he was a patsy, that just seemed to get washed under the rug. And a lot of this information never even came out until the '70s, when you had Jim Garrison in his court cases. But looking at looking at the '70s, you know, you got Watergate, um, Congress looking at the CIA. Nothing really happened. They did an investigation. Maybe some things got out like the heart attack gun. Oh, we'll give them a couple little secrets. But, you know, what do you think the CIA is up to now in this day and age? I mean, how far have they come since they were created? I mean, since JFK threatened to destroy them back then. And, and now, what has the CIA morphed into now? Well, it's, it's hard to figure out sometimes where the CIA begins and the NSA ends, the mafia, the DIA. I mean, these are all separate entities. And... Uh, they, as you mentioned, they had, it looked like at that time in the mid '70s the public was on board with. They were outraged. Uh, I got one example I like to give of how far we've sunk morally is that 1976 President Ford signed an executive order of all people, a member of the Warren Commission, 
signed an executive order under pressure from Congress, the leftist Congress, to ban assassination by American, you know, as, as a tool. And we recognized at the time, polls showed that most Americans would have opposed assassinating Hitler. That's the way we felt about assassination is morally at that point. Fast forward less than 40 years later, Barack Obama assassinates Anwar Awlaki, an American citizen, and the next month assassinates his 16-year-old son with drones and brags about it, at least bragged about Anwar Awlaki, and, uh, you know, spikes the football. And, you know, Hillary Clinton and everybody else talking, bragging about killing people. Whereas, again, less than 40 years ago, even someone like a Warren Commission member could realize that he had to at least put on a face that he was opposed to this, you know, when the, uh, the allegations uh, came out about uh, them trying to assassinate Castro. So that's how far we've sunk. So at this point, it's hard to tell what the CIA or any other organization is up to because we've, we've moved the moral compass so far that you know, when, we, when we can celebrate assassination, as Obama and the Democrats do at this point, and a lot of the Republicans do, I mean, if, if Obama is criticized by people like McCainiac, I call him McCainiac because I think it's a more appropriate name for him, or Lindsey Graham, people like that, they actually are acting as if he's soft, and then he needs to do more, kill more people, bomb more countries. And that's, that's where we've gone at this point. Yeah, the chicken hawks can't get enough death, especially the ones who didn't go to war and hid from the draft and don't want their kids going into the, into the armed forces and serving. You know, before, it used to be presidents served. They were generals. They, they had their sons serving. They were proud to serve the country. And now, you don't get that. You get them, uh, uh, you know, fortunate sons is what you get. And that's what you have all over. Now, I, I, I want to end this. What, what do we do? A third party. I mean, what are, the, what are the possibilities of a new third party happening? We almost saw it in the, in the early 90s with Ross Perot coming in, and then he got scared out because people actually, he, it looked like he could win at some point. He could upset the balance, and he, and he went out, and then he came back, and it wasn't enough to, uh, to take, a, take the election, but it was enough to get rid of Bush. I mean, is there a possibility of a third party coming along? And who do you see as, as maybe stepping out in that third party? Well, Rob, I, I'd love to think so. But I tell you, I, I, I recently, you know, I, the last elections disappointed me so much because it really came home to, to me anyhow, to try to reconcile the fact that all public opinion polls show that Congress has less than 10 percent approval rating. You know, nobody likes them, apparently. But we just recently saw that the voters reelected 96 percent of the incumbents to Congress. How do we reconcile that? I mean, given what we know of voting fraud, I don't know if we can count that, you know, can, can trust that the votes are being uh, honestly counted. And, and actually, a worse option would be if they are being honestly counted and people are really overwhelmingly uh, reelecting virtually everyone that they claim they don't trust. So at this point, a third party can't. I mean, I, I love Ron Paul. Um, I love Dennis Kucinich. Again, I don't think it's a left-right thing. I think Cynthia McKinney is a great person. I would, I would love to see her in there. Rand Paul, I, right now, he would be the one. I mean, I'll still go out and vote. I'm hoping they count the votes. But if, uh, if Rand Paul gets a chance, I think because he's Ron Paul's son, and I hope he's just playing politics here, hope he is, uh, I think he's our best hope at this point of somebody who has a reasonable chance of uh, being elected. But I think all those pre-election polls that, as you mentioned, <clears throat> are going to anoint a front runner before a single vote has been cast are probably going to relegate him down in the lower tiers and claim he's, you know, he's at however many percent they claim he is, and it's between Jeb Bush and uh, Chris Christie or whoever, what other establishment favorite they decide to trot out. Yeah, I think any dark horse that has a chance, you're going to see death by a thousand candidates. And you saw it with Ron Paul. Somebody would get into the race, oh, and now they're the new front runner, and then they kind of fall back. And Ron was always there, always one, two, or three in the polls but they kept bringing in new front runners and just have something else to talk about. So they didn't have to mention Ron Paul. Uh, my brother actually did a, his uh, statistics thesis was the amount of coverage that Ron Paul got compared to what other people got that weren't even polling nearly as high as him. And it's, it's laughable how the mainstream media treated him. And then after he was totally out, they're like, oh, maybe it would have been good to have Ron Paul. I mean, they just, they totally sucker us in. Um, if, if I have to say one thing about your book here, Hidden History. I mean, it is an encyclopedia of information that you're not going to get in a tech. If they put this as a textbook in, uh, say, maybe junior high, high school, if I was a sophomore in high school and read this book, I would totally be blown away. And I think it would change public opinion on a massive scale. You get these new voters coming in going, hey, man, it's not what they say it is. And people know it's all fake now. The people that are looking for information on the internet, they know this. 
But here you have it in a, in a really solid piece of uh, literature that I think everybody should be reading because it really does lay out how the corruption has just morphed into what it is today. And, you know, but you even put some uh, positive spin at the end. Like, what can you say positive about, you know, learning all this corruption and negligence and criminality? I mean, what do we get from this? What's the positive spin on this? Well, you, you mentioned something that I think more and more young people are becoming awake. They're, they're not watching uh, television news as much, and that, that's the first step, I think. And there's just so much out there on the Internet, they may even just accidentally stumble onto truth. And uh, it, it's, it's their, the thing that, you know, when I argue with people, they talk about people running things. I said, you know, just because you're powerful doesn't mean you have to be competent. And, you know, these people are not necessarily great at what they do. I mean, they make crappy conspirators, to be honest with you. But they have ultimate power. And because of that, uh, it's, it's hard to break through that wall. But with the Internet, I mean, certainly with Alex Jones and, and, and Coast to Coast and, and things like that, more and more people are being exposed to the alternative view that they're never going to get on television. That's why it's so important to make sure that the Internet stays free. And I think it will, because I really think the powers that be have wanted to shut it down for a long, long time. And I think if they would have, uh, they would have already done that. They could have. But, um, you know, I think the young people are the hope that more and more people, and also people that are uh, ex experience job loss and, and the awful economy, they're not going to, you know, keep believing that everything's rosy. I mean, the unemployment figures, when, you know, they, they trot out these, I mean, that's one of the big examples of the lies that they tell us. I try to tell people all the time, they're counting only those that are filing for unemployment benefits. The real unemployment rate's probably 25% or more. I mean, they tell you how many unemployed people there are, do the math, but when you tell people that, especially young people who are having a hard time getting jobs, if they get a college degree, they're mired in debt, and they're not getting the jobs they used to have, so they can understand it. So I think they're waking up to it, and you know they have to they have to have enough people out there buying whatever it is they're selling to make an economy viable. So I, I'm holding out some hope that you know that young people will be able to turn it around. I got two final questions for you, really short, uh, and thank you for joining us and spending some time with us. What do you think is the biggest conspiracy that has totally changed the way America is, its, its total framework, the biggest one? And then what is the one that people don't know about? What is the biggest unknown conspiracy? Well, I, I, I have to still say the assassination of President Kennedy, for, especially for people of my generation, uh, because that really opened people's eyes. Once uh, the first best-selling books were published on the subject, and they realized exactly who was lying to us. Uh, you know, and, that, of course, that led the way to the expose exposures in the uh, in the 70s with the CIA and so forth. When people realized the government could lie to us, and then they realized that the uh, the media wasn't necessarily telling us the truth, I think that's the biggest one, because the president of the United States was killed in, in broad daylight, and the crime was never investigated. Now, certainly for the generation of people coming behind them, 9-11 is, is, is kind of like that, and obviously it's on a even grander scale. But uh, the underreported conspiracy, I would say, and hopefully my book reflects that, is, is what I believe was the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. I think most people accepted the uh, official story of the plane crash, and uh, I believe I was able to launch uh, the first really independent, in-depth investigation of his death. And I think we established that the official uh, narrative there is just as impossible as virtually all the other official narratives are. Yeah, I agree. The information you have on the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. and his plane crash is just monumental. The the missing reporters that people can't find that were supposedly eyewitnesses to this, um, just the air, the weather forecast, the air traffic control uh, logs. I mean, you have it all in there. And really, no one else has touched John F. Kennedy Jr. since then. It was like, well, he's dead, and let's just move on. And I, I totally agree with you on that. Thanks for joining us, Don Jeffries. He is the author of Hidden History, which you can get at the Infowars.com store. I encourage you to get this book, read it, and then give it to a friend because it really does have a treasure, treasure trove of information that you may have forgotten. It may be hazy with the passage of time, but this brings it all back home and keeps it up to date and current. Thanks for joining us, Don. And that's going to do it for us here at Infowars.com and the Infowars.com Command Center here at Deep Behind Enemy Lines in Central Texas. Thanks to Don Jeffries for that interview, and David Knight for doing the news. I encourage you to pick up Don's book, once again, Hidden History. It is a great read. A lot of stuff in there that I didn't know, and I thought I knew a lot and, uh, until I read this book, and it really does bring a lot of stuff to light that uh, you may have forgotten about. But anyway, if you are uh, a member of PrisonPlanet.tv, we thank you for your support. But if you're not, I encourage you. Look, there's my one of my reports right there. Navy proves flu shot causes flu. 
I encourage you to check out that report. And, uh, and there's Jesse and Alex uh, going head to head on different subjects. That's gonna be a reoccurring series here. But you get all that and much more on PrisonPlanet.tv. So if you are watching this on YouTube, I encourage you to be a member. We have a really uh, great deal going. It's about $6 a month, $5.95, and you get to share your username and password with up to 20 people. So it's a great deal. Please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. And if you are a member, thank you once again for your support. In the past decade, we have witnessed unparalleled scientific discoveries in the area of health. But no one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. DNA Force is one of the most expensive formulas to produce. Some of the ingredients in DNA Force are $12,000 a kilogram. We are using the coveted, patented, only American source of PQQ, CoQ10, and more. You want the best that's out there at the lowest price anywhere? Well, we're bringing you a total win-win. The ultimate value, cutting-edge, trailblazing game changer that also supports the info war. We have produced a limited run of DNA Force, and it will take up to 12 weeks to produce more once we sell out. Secure your DNA Force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. DNA Force from InfoWars Life. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.